live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Wish your financial situation were sexier? Well, today... We learn how to spice things up in the bedroom and every other room in your house by communicating with your partner about money with Aaron Sky Kelly. For our TikTok Minute, we'll prove you can still look great while saving a buck. In our headlines, crypto is in the news again. Time to put on your diamond hands and go all in? We have opinions. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Stacker Zachary. Shouldn't that be Stackery Zachary? Anyway, who wants to know which companies are leaving money on the table with their lackluster ad campaigns? And then, if you're game, I'll share some joyful trivia. And now, two guys who I like to describe as indoorsy, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Hey there, stackers, and happy Monday to you. I am Joe Saul Cihai, and across the card table from me, the most indoorsy guy that we know, Mr. OG. How are you, my friend? Happy Monday. I'm a little indoorsy, uh, only because it's a thousand degrees, although I get outside every day now. I, I, uh, I'm a, I'm a, well, now I wouldn't call myself a pro cyclist at this point. But uh, you're but stopping moving, just short of that. I'm moving toward it. <laughs> the big question is, is, uh, he's got an electric bike and he's considering joining some I races. Do not have an electric bike. Thank you very much. The first first professional cyclist with a huffy. <laughs> Laugh if you want. I just got a brand new bike and I'm loving it. Oh, nice. Fantastic. You upgraded to the Schwinn. Got now you got the Schwinn. Schwinn, bro. Settle down. Oh, that sucks. Schwinn's a good brand. Hey. Welcome to the uh, the Hey, We Like to Bicycle podcast. I'm Joe Saul Cihai. I have a show money on Twitter. We already said that, did we? And I'm going right back into it. I did, I've been out of the office for just over a week and I'm losing it. But, you know, we're going to get it back together here because Erin Sky Kelly, OG, is back. She is back. People may know her as uh, somebody who does a lot of touring with a little guy named um, Tony Robbins. There's nothing little about Tony Robbins. Big it's hands. really nothing small. <laughs> His teeth are as big as my nothing ears. Small. <laughs> he does have big <laughs> teeth, but Aaron Sky Kelly does not. Uh, she has a great, great new book uh, where she's talking about getting out of debt. And for people that didn't hear Aaron when she was on the show a couple of years ago, we're about to have some fun talking about getting naked with our money. Oh, gee. But before that, we got a headline. Let's go. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. I'm going to apologize to everybody because I'm just like a pony with a cough. Oh, gee, I'm a little horse. No, God. Uh, Is Len writing just, for you now? <laughs> Is Len Penzo <laughs> your own personal joke <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Uh, today's headline comes to us from CNBC. People are like, God, you guys were off last week. Why didn't you stay off, please? A spot Bitcoin ETF, OG, a spot Great. Bitcoin ETF, much closer to reality, but investors aren't quite there yet. This is written by Bob Pisani. Uh, Bob writes, well, now the SEC is in a real pickle. The U.S. Court Jill? of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit sided with Grayscale in a lawsuit against the SEC, greatly improving the chances that a Bitcoin exchange traded fund will be approved. The SEC had earlier denied Grayscale's application and converted its Grayscale Bitcoin trust to an ETF. Looks like uh, we're getting another, possibly another, Bitcoin-derived ETF on the market. I would be really interested to see what the uptake is of that since the mania surrounding Bitcoin has kind of died down. This is going to be much ado about nothing. The SEC is like, yeah, go ahead and make him make a make a mutual fund or ETF. Let's see how much money you raise. Oh, you didn't raise enough money and you shut it down. Weird. I, I just don't understand. I mean, this is so this is a spot Bitcoin ETF and, and a, a spot ETF means it works a lot like a futures contract. So they look at Bitcoin futures contracts buying buying those. And because of the fact that the SEC in the past has approved a Bitcoin uh, futures-based product. 
The court said, in essence, and I'm quoting Bob Pisani, hey, you prove a futures based Bitcoin product. The futures and spot market are like products. If you prove one, you have to approve the other. I'm in the market for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't I don't understand why you would want to put that. It, it, it's not it's not any more liquid because you can trade Bitcoin instantaneously. Right. Maybe 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 because it's lower, uh, maybe some lower carrying costs because you're buying it at scale. Uh, you know, because when you when you when you are trading costs, I should say, you know, when you trade your Bitcoin, you get some pretty awful prices if you're if you're if you're not paying attention to. Uh, to where you're buying it and selling it, uh, a lot of a lot of commissions baked into it. Um, but if you're buying it from an investment standpoint, and you're saying this is a this is an investment I believe in, why wouldn't you just go out and buy the thing? Yeah, if you're taking you that much open, risk, just get your Coinbase account. And if you're taking it. that much risk in your portfolio with that type of volatility, and still no appreciable history that we can look back on. Uh, on these products to to really talk about what stimuli change the market. If you're going to take that type of risk, I'm I'm with you. Why? It's almost like you're you're just dipping your toe in a. You know they say dip your toe in the water. You're dipping your toe in a. I'm trying to find the analogy in a uh, at a boiling pool of water. I don't know. Yes. Oh, gee, there are nine of these products. There must be a demand because there's nine of these products for a spot Bitcoin ETF that are that the SEC is uh, is going to rule on. The first one was the ARC uh, 21 shares Bitcoin trust. Then there's Grayscale, which they just talked about. Uh, Bitwise, Bitcoin, BlackRock, uh, Vanek, Wisdom Tree, Valkyrie, Invesco and Fidelity uh, even has one that they're that they're trying to get approved. I just don't understand yeah. if I'm buying, if I don't get if, it, if I'm buying, if I'm buying this type of product, I'm just buying it. Buy yourself some crypto and, and go get diamond hands as Doug likes to say. J- yeah. Doug, Doug's a big fan of jazz, jazz hands. Is that a ste- yeah, are diamond hands a step up from jazz hands? I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm not afraid if that's, if it's better. That's, it. that's exactly where he goes it like this. I think our I think our takeaway there is uh, just just if you're going to buy it, buy it. And by the way, OG, buy Bitcoin. yeah. And and, and, and and what's your cap in a portfolio of buying this type of thing? Like sandbox money, what, two, three? Roughly zero <laughs> percent. <laughs> is that rounding? Are you rounding for that? Buy as close to up. Buy as close to zero as you feel comfortable with. I, I just hover around there. If you get nervous around zero, then I go even less. I think my crypto account has five grand in it. I think mine has uh, fifteen. Uh, no, mine is eighteen hundred. You know why? I know yep. it's all. It had five grand in it. Didn't it's, it? No, it's it's all in <laughs> Ethereum. It went down. I bought it. I bought it a year ago. I was I was actually in Colorado, and I get a I get a notice on my phone that says that my my account with my uh, Ethereum has a notification. I'm like, oh man, what happened? Has has the has 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 it finally happened? Can I retire? I was actually thinking the other. I'm like, is it finally worthless? Is it? Can I stop checking it? And I saw that it had gone up like 5.6 percent already that day. Wow! Back to about eighty dollars below where I bought it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, by the way, with just a little actionable thing here with your crypto, right now, presently, there's no wash sale requirements for cryptocurrency. So if you do have uh, an investment of Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, and it's gone down, you can sell it, take the capital loss, turn around and rebuy it the next nanosecond and establish a new cost basis. So if you're looking for ways to save a few bucks on taxes, you can do that. Got to be aware of the, you got to be aware of the, there's a commission, right? So there's a trading cost to do that. So, so be, be cognizant Hmm. of that. But, um, um, but you can, wiped out that uh, that loss and kind of start over new year new joe what i'm still stuck on is you said you're at about five thousand in yours does that sure. show up on your pie chart as nearly zero percent yes because <laughs> holy crap that's a hell of a portfolio Here's- if it rounds to zero percent well for- i can't do the math on how many zeros are on your total portfolio for planning purposes he calls it zero 
We're going to dive more in into this. And by the way, part of the SEC's uh, ruling on this was that uh, they feel like the futures market in crypto, believe it or not, OG, can be manipulated. I know you find that hard hard to believe. What? There might be forces no, manipulating these markets. I know. It's, it is weird. We will dive more into that in the 201, our newsletter that comes out on Tuesdays and Thursdays, where we dive deeper into these these areas uh, with curated links to people who are really in the weeds on all of these topics. StackingBenjamins.com slash 201 to get the 201 newsletter. Time for our TikTok Minute. This is a part of the show where we dive into a TikTok creator either doing something brilliant or hashtag brilliant. Um, we know which way OG is probably going. So, Doug, we'll go back to you here at the beginning of another eight weeks. You think this is brilliant or hashtag brilliance? Um, I'm skeptical today. And on this one, Joe, I know where I normally lean, um, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to say it's mostly brilliant. The- like it has, I think it probably has some niche use. It's some part of all of our listeners' lives, but I don't know that it's a blank. I can go blanket statement. Oh, God, just pick one. Please, God. (laughs) (laughs) Can I qualify it a little bit more? Here's what I'm... No. Here's what I'm... Bet this is an ABC News report. This is from TikTok user Mamezi, who actually stole it directly from ABC News. Uh, And this is why, OG, when when a... um, when, When an influencer tells you that something is a great deal and is awesome, you might still want to think about it a little bit. Behold, Palessi. We built a fake luxury store in Los Angeles and filled it with Payless shoes. The guests at our grand opening party had no idea. Guests invited to check out what looked like a luxury shoe shop. They're elegant, sophisticated. I just think it's so classy. And I can tell it was made with high quality material. A $35 shoe going for $645 an 1,800% markup. Store owners sat on their heels as fashion influencers emptied their wallets. I would pay 400, 500, yeah. People are gonna be like, where'd you get those? Those are amazing. Then they're let in on the prank. These are actually from Payless. What? You've got to be kidding me. Shut up. Shut up. (laughs) The best, the best marketing scheme ever. Uh, This is not a new thing. This is, this came out years ago. And all I could think of is how did pay less convince ABC news to be their outlet for this? I'd never seen that before. Oh yeah. That was that that's years old. I was gonna say, I saw, I saw it a while ago. Um, on brand. Pelesi. I love that. They, they put it high on Pelesi. The, Pelesi for pay less. So, so good. We still see this. Be careful. We still see this today though. I mean, we see it all the time. These these Instagram influencers. What was the first thing? What's this brand of pants? These people need to be a sponsor because I keep talking about Vioris. Vioris. Yeah. Lulu's. Yes. Which is my my personal proclivities. Well, we we actually you and I at dinner with our spouses. OG, we're talking about this. And why? Because I had seen all over my social hot joggers. I saw all over my social media. All I saw was this uh, commercials for this product. Just Instagram person after I mean, Instagram. been around for several years, so I'd never heard of that time you caught up. Good stuff. Thanks to stacker Jennifer for sending that to us. You got one, send it to me, Joe at stackybenjamins.com. Coming up next, Aaron Sky Kelly is a woman who is in deep debt herself. She teaches other people how to, to quote the title of her first book, get the hell out of debt. And today she's going to be teaching us how to get naked with our money. Oh, wow. Yes. It. It's a uh, little last thing I need to see is uh, d- I am all in. Doug naked with his money. Oh, man. <laughs> Let's <laughs> naked with all eleven dollars and twenty eight cents. Not a lot of dollar bills covering it. <laughs> can we can we have Doug I'll let you figure out where the coins go? If we could have Doug not get naked with the trivia, that would be great. <laughs> while Aaron comes down to the basement. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And on this day in 1977, the legendary Atari released their first game console. Five years earlier, the company's founders gave new hire Alan Alcorn an assignment to create a test project. But that that's Alan Alcorn, not to be confused with my pet squirrel that I've named Alan Acorn. Anyway, with no prior video game making knowledge, Alcorn built the now legendary Pong. 
Although Pong was never intended for commercial release, Atari's founders knew they had a great product and soon put it on the market. Later, as Atari grew, the company hired two young developers. I mean, I don't know. You've never heard of these guys. Steve Jobs and Steve Woz Niaki, whoever they are, to help create new games. Today's trivia question is, how many units of Atari were sold between its launch in 1977 and its final day of production in 1992? Is it 3 million, 30 million, or 300 million? I'll be right back with the answer after I give Alan Acorn a bath. Hey there, stackers. I'm video game lover and retired squirrel groomer, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. On this day in 1977, gaming company Atari released their namesake console, Atari. By the end of that year, the company had already sold nearly 400,000 units at 200 bucks a pop, or about a thousand bucks in today's dollars. All in, that's $80 million worth of joystick. Man, my wrist getting tired just thinking of that. Today's trivia question was, how many units of the Atari 2600 were sold between its launch in 1977 and its final day of production in 1992? Was it 3 million, 30 million, or 300 million? The answer, 30 million. Do the math, and even at the original price, that's enough income to buy an entire country. Time for me to learn how to build Ataris. So, how does 30 million stand up to today's consoles? Sony so far has sold over 560 million PlayStations. Apparently, we're even more addicted to video games. And now, here to help prevent you from having finance-related arguments with your partner, it's Aaron Sky Kelly. And I'm super happy she's sitting down with us at the card table in the basement again. Erin Sky Kelly's back. Hi. My cheeks already hurt from laughing and we haven't even started. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm excited. You know, everybody's excited except mom because I heard you're here to get naked. Are you here to get naked? Listen, mom, clothing is optional. OK, I promise you <laughs> we're going to get naked emotionally. We're going to get oh. real and raw and naked when it comes to our money. Ambiguity. Ambi well, because... As you know, a lot of people, when they are talking about their money or thinking about their money, they are trying to like imagine in their mind that things are better than they actually are. Yes. And that inhibits their wealth building. Right. Or if I just don't look at it, if I put yeah. lots of clothes on it, to use your analogy, <laughs> if I stuff it full of clothes and I wear the right color, I'll look great, even yeah. though it's a mess. Yeah. And so now when we see that somebody's got their head in the sand, financially speaking, we're going to be like, you've got a financial moo moo on right now. That's what you and I'll call it. <laughs> you, you, in fact, say you begin this project by saying that uh, it, a lot of the concepts you use in this book will make grandma blush. Yeah. I mean, I have the same sense of humor as you, I think. So it's like I will walk that line a little bit. So if somebody's really sensitive with you know, euphemisms or that kind of a thing. It's probably not going to be the book for you, but. Well, let's, let's actually talk about what this is all about. Cause I think we actually get, get to it right in the dedication, like the dedication sets the stage, which I don't think I've ever, you know, what, 12 years of doing this here. And I don't think I'm ever like, let's talk about the dedication, <laughs> but, but the dedicated, I just want to read your words to everybody. Cause sure. this is, this is good. So a reading, a dramatic reading by Joe Salsi high of Aaron <laughs> Scott Kelly. Before we said goodbye, we plopped down on the return couch in the as-is section. Like, what a great opening line. Uh, he'd met me there because it was a two birds and one stone scenario. The birds were that I need to pick up furniture for a rental and that we hadn't had a visit in a long time. The stone was Ikea. <laughs> I think. I think we saw at least a half dozen romantic relationships die in the warehouse that day. I've seen the same uh, people arguing over that. Uh, all while we were unknowingly building ours up from friendship to love. Our conversation flowed freely while I interrupted with measurements or photographs of things named null roughs or ladder lappin, or maybe my favorite, Svenskak. I'm going to say that very quickly. <laughs> either I, there's, there's Aaron Tuber right there. It, either, I, either I had to be somewhere or I pre-lied and said I had to be somewhere in case he wanted to visit longer because time wasn't a luxury for me then. But when we completed the maze, we sat down briefly to wrap up whatever story one of us was in the middle of telling. Somehow on that clip and sofa, everything shifted. 
In the years that have followed, we built more than just furniture, but there have been times when I wanted to take advantage of IKEA's very generous return policy and drop him off with the receipts. I felt that way about Cheryl's felt that way about me, but to put it more bluntly. <laughs> Certainly, he would have exchanged me for something that came with clear instructions and wasn't missing parts. I don't know exactly how we got from here to there, but it involved a lot of taking apart and putting back together. But we reminded ourselves that we are called to love as is. And that has been our commitment ever since. That's what a great dedication. Oh, thank you. You just made me, when I hear you say it, I'm like, oh, that is kind of romantic. That whole <laughs> <laughs> it was romantic. But, tell me, but, but, it, but it is true, right? I mean, we are as is. And I think you spend a lot of time in this project talking about how we're as is. Yeah. And I think the thing that's most important for me is that I've seen so many couples because, of course, I've done a lot of work with people helping them get out of debt. The first book was called Get the Hell Out of Debt. And so I've seen a lot of couples come at relationship problems with a financial lens instead of coming at finances with a relational lens. Oh. And so what I see happen, and I know you see it too over and over again, is people are fighting about money, but it's not about the money. And so it's really important to me that we understand that our partners are not ever going to be right and we're not ever going to be right. We're only ever seeing things through our own lenses. And it's important to try not to change our partner's financial behaviors, not to try and fix them, but to love unconditionally from a place of understanding that those financial patterns are there because of something that happened to them in childhood or something that happened to them in early adulthood. And they keep living it out over and over, even though they might not be seeing the results they want to see from it. So we have to look past those incidents and see that the child or the, or the wound that that person's operating their finances from and love them from that place. If we want to heal what's going on in our wallets. So hard though. It is. I so mean, hard. Been, this will be 30 years that yeah. Cheryl and I have been married this year, Aaron. And literally, years. so yesterday we were flying somewhere together Yeah, and uh, we were actually flying. So we we're flying back home from somewhere. But I remember she said something. I'm like, she just wouldn't do that anymore. Right. <laughs> if, she would, if she would not do that thing. I'm like, it's been 30 years. Yeah. And we still do it. We still get, I still get judgy after 30 years. Yeah. So well, because the other thing is you are a financial expert. So it's really hard, I think, for you to take off that expert lens and see your wife as a like soul to soul, human to human, when you know that you know, behaviors lead people to a certain place or, you know, things that people do, patterns that they have lead to a certain outcome that they don't want, but we keep self, self-sabotaging self anyway. It's the most bizarre thing that we do. And it, we're not doing it because we're um, trying to screw up or we're, you know, we're most of the time we don't even recognize we're doing it. Like the amount of people I see, and I know it's the same for you, you, you run into people who have a financial challenge and they're like, I don't understand why I keep making the same mistake. And it's because of these money patterns or these money blocks that we have unconsciously that are running the show. So Cheryl's got a money block that's driving you crazy, right? It's driving you nuts, but you can't fix it for her. And she can't change the block unless she deals with what's going on underneath that's causing that block to happen. And she can consciously recondition a new pattern. That's what's going to change for her. And it may never. So you got to be okay with the fact that, like, if I said to you, Joe, listen, 30 years from now, when Cheryl's old and wrinkly like a raisin and, you know... <laughs> You have to rub her Ben Gay on her gnarled little fingers. She's still going to be doing this thing. Can you love her anyway? And the answer for you is going to be yes, of course. But for some people, the answer is going to be no. And that's where we run into problems because we have to make some swift changes right away if the answer is no. Well, and I thought about that reading your words because, because you know, there's this one thing that bothers me about her. I'm sure reading through your money blocks, there's like five that I have. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I'm sure drive her crazy. And somehow we made it. What, what is yeah. a naked money meeting? So a naked money meeting is really about you being completely vulnerable and like raw and honest with where you are so that when you're having conversations with your partner, it's not about like you're spending too much on Dunkin Donuts. You need to change that. It's about understanding. Listen, when you're spending that much money on Dunkin Donuts, I feel like our retirement is going to a donut shop and I'm getting very scared and fearful that we're not going to have enough. Can we talk about that? Instead of putting the blame on someone else, it's taking full and real responsibility. Like, I don't know if you've ever been naked in front of a mirror before. Do you do that? Or is that just a woman thing? I do, I do, I do, I do like, I'm naked right now. 
<laughs> Sometimes I just open my pants and just look down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you're naked in front of the mirror, like you cannot hide. Right. Like you right. can you can wear a push up bra. I mean, you can, too. You can wear a push up bra. You can do all the things. But the minute you're naked that you step out of the shower, it's like everything is real and raw. And so that is what the truth is. And so a naked money meeting is really getting to the truth behind the numbers. And what's interesting is that we all have basically a money block. You've alluded to this. I'll explain what this is. And then that that may help explain a a naked money meeting. So we all have um, certain money blocks, things that prevent us from really reaching our full financial potential. For some people, that means financial freedom. For some people, that means getting out of debt. For some people, that means having enough in their savings account to feel comfortable. But there's always something that's kind of preventing us. Very few people have zero money blocks. And basically, that block is there because of a series of things that have happened, as we talked about, that formed a pattern or a behavior that we live out even if we don't like the result of it but it's because it's what we know. And humans are, we're horrible for that. We do the same thing over and over and over again. The amount of times I've eaten Cheetos and been like, I got to stop doing this, but I eat them anyway, right? I'll have orange fingers on me like, this has got to change. And it doesn't change, right? Because I remember as a kid being rewarded with Cheetos when I would get to hang out with my brothers and I felt cool and I felt like included. And so Cheetos for me means something completely different than Cheetos mean for my friend who does yoga. Very, very different, you know, interpretation of Cheetos. Yeah. Same thing with money. So there are what we've discovered or I've discovered essentially through doing this work through years and years and years is that there are eight major money blocks. And so we all have what's called a primary block, right? So for some people that it's called a spend block, but there's 20 different ways it'll show up, right? It's so it might mean a spend block might mean that every time money hits your bank account, you just feel compelled to get rid of it. So you're either buying stuff or you're just immediately paying bills, but you're not building your own wealth first. Other people, they might have um, $60,000 in credit card debt and $80,000 in savings, but they just can't pay off that credit card debt. And so the spend block is there stopping them because they don't want to let go of that money, right? So basically, anything that blocks the flow of wealth is what we would call a money block. Uh, I can't tell you how often, Aaron, I saw that when I, but I haven't been a financial planner in a long time. But yeah. back when I was, I would see that all the time. Yes. And I'm like, hey, I, I know you're paying me a lot of money. Take that money. And pay off that debt. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Like, yeah. it's, 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 and they're like, I can't do it. I, I can't. I can't do it. It's a block. It's a major block. And when they understand why, and it gets easier, right? But we have to condition that new pattern so that they get used to sort of more of an expansion than a contraction. The expansion being growing into building more wealth versus like restricting and feeling like that that sense of I can't is is basically fear. Is what that is. So when they when we can kind of understand what our primary block is, we really can clearly then see how it's stopping us from building wealth. And so then we as we slowly undo that block, what we'll notice is even without a whole lot of trying, like it doesn't have to be a grind. It doesn't have to be that sort of hustle mentality. It doesn't have to be that way. The flow of money into our lives will be easier because we're not getting in our own way. So what happens is you have a primary money block and Cheryl has a primary money block. And where those two blocks intersect, I can tell you what's going on in your relationship and what you're fighting about. And that's where the fascinating work happens. But this so is but, but, money. Me- what's that? But this is also, I mean, but this money meeting you point out can happen alone. It can happen like, alone. Even if you're yeah. solo, it, it, it can be really <laughs> interesting. The way having, you say that. What's that? The way you say that. <laughs> you, can, I- you can turn the lights off and light a candle and be by yourself. <laughs> this is sit in the tub and just <laughs> just think about no but, yeah. I, but, but 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 seriously i mean you know you, you say that you can't you know you can't solve other people's issues you mm-hmm. can just know what you've got inside and i think yeah. for many of us it, it was funny because when i read this work i thought this was all going to be about like the uh tactics around having mm-hmm. the meeting and it's not at all no. and it's also not as as much about the other person like this this yeah. whole work is about what's inside of you not the yeah. other person I know. And I joke in the book, like, I'm sure you're here because you want me to tell me that your partners, you want me to tell your partner that they're wrong. And so, you know, I'm I'm not going to do that. When we go to couples counseling, like the amount of people, you know, women are like, oh, I think we should go to couples counseling. What they're secretly hoping for is the counselor's going to be like, you're an idiot. And he's wrong. Yeah. Right. Right. Your husband is a moron. Thank you. That's both of us. Right. (laughs) So what's interesting about any sort of work in relationship is 
when there's a pattern in the relationship, like where your money block and Cheryl's money block, for instance, where those intersect and it's causing maybe a bit of financial friction or financial resentment or whatever's happening, all you need to do is change you for that pattern to change. So we don't even need to worry about our partners changing. We have to love them wholly and completely for who they are, as we've mentioned, and we can do our own work on ourselves. And that will inevitably change the pattern anyway. Now, usually what happens is when that pattern shifts, a partner usually comes on board, especially if they love you, um, they will usually get on board. But when you try and drag your partner or like convince them they need to do something or you nag them to change, it, it doesn't work. So the only person who really ultimately can do this work is you. It makes a bigger block for me. Yeah, like if Cheryl tells me to stop doing something. That means I found the button. It's <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You wanted that garbage taken out this week? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the middle of something. Yeah, why do we do that? I don't know why we do that. They talk about sabotage. That's a whole different thing. But uh, so, so where does budgeting fit in here then? Oh, well, there's definitely some like tactical, practical information, you know, involved in all of this, but it, it, and obviously you have to manage the cash flow and you have to manage your net worth and the budget's job is to increase the net worth. But if you've got a money block, you might find that budgeting just isn't working the way it ought to be. Like you just keep sabotaging, right? Yep. Or, or yep. for some people like who have what's called a hard work block, their primary belief underneath everything is that in order to have more money, I have to work more, more hours or I have to work harder. And we see this sometimes even in a generational thing. And it bleeds out into other people because we often put upon other people the idea that, oh, that person's so great. They're such a hard worker. And so we honor that, which reinforces that that's how they need to get out of debt. But they're running out of time. They're exhausted. They're, you know, doing so much. So it, it's the relationship between that and budgeting is that if you're working three jobs and you're running ragged, Sometimes if we're not paying attention to those dollars, the results of what we're doing aren't showing up in that net worth or in that budget. And so we have to do, we absolutely have to keep control of the cash flow is coming in so that we can see that the work we're doing matters. And what's cool about this is when you master, you know, all this, I'm, I feel it's so funny talking to you about this. Cause I'm like, Oh, I'm going to explain budgeting to Joe. Great. I think this, is, this is super. No, because well, this is way more psychological. I think than most people get into budgeting, me included. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're going way deeper here, sister. <laughs> and I don't think I even understood this. Like when I was, you know, for if you're brand new to Aaron Sky Kelly, um, at one point in my life, I was $2.1 million in debt. And I really thought it was a math problem. And then when I uncovered a lot of things, I was like, wait a second, wait a second. I, I was behaving this way or doing this because I was trying to out earn my spending. And I was trying to do all these other, you know, things that didn't work. So I had to get to the root of all that. Then when I got out of debt and started to build wealth and other people would ask me how and I would help them, I saw these patterns in other people and I just started to document everything because I was fascinated by what was going on. And the other interesting piece is that if you just try and do this work, like this sort of psychological money mindset stuff, but you're not tracking your money, it's useless because you don't know, you won't have the proof the numbers don't lie, as you know, right? We can convince ourselves of anything, right? I can, conv all through COVID, I convinced myself my weight gain wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And then, you know, I had a naked moment in front of the mirror. I'm like, okay, we got to deal with this. This is, it's time. But it's right? funny but, but because it's, it's a tracking combined with emotion. Like it's not either yeah. or, if it's all emotion, you're right, big deal. But yeah. if I see that my emotions go this way and my spending pattern follows it, then it's going to be easier to follow yeah. the, the river toward where the blocks are. You got it. Absolutely. The interesting thing is most people will know. I mean, I have a quiz in the book. It's like this chapter four is like this comprehensive, like, you know, and very and a lot comprehensive. Of women, yeah. And, and so there's a shortened abridged version on the Internet at nakedmoneymeetings.com. But a lot of women love the book because it reminds them of doing the Cosmo quizzes that we all did <laughs> 20 years ago. You know, you'd sit down with a magazine and then. You know, you, you figure out if you're hot girl, you're good girl, hot or bad girl, hot. Those, those titles always <laughs> crack me up. You know, eight ways to please your man. Yeah. Like you're like, what? What yeah. the hell? <laughs> stupid. All stupid. It's got a big comprehensive quiz in it. So it'll tell you what your primary block is. And, and for a lot of people, they're like, oh, my gosh, I have all the blocks. Right. Oh, my gosh. This is all right. of them. And, and there are eight. But you will have a you, most people have a primary and a secondary. But what's interesting is that if you um, just read the headings for the blocks, like you know, the lack block, the spend block, the worthiness block. I, I, once you read those, most people are like, oh, I that one, that one, that one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Without even doing the quiz. So you well, let's go it. through them. Let's go through them and okay. let's just do a few sentences on each. 
Sure. Just so people know uh, uh, these different blocks. Uh, the lack block. Yeah, well, the lack block is really all about your focus being on all the things you don't have versus all of the things that you do. And this is really important because this is sometimes a learned behavior. People think, oh, I'm just a pessimist and you know this other person's an optimist. It's not true. It's where your focus is. And so when you've been conditioned to focus on what's missing for long enough, what happens is you end up in a lack mindset. And so you'll sabotage yourself because even when something good comes your way, it's almost like you can't believe it. So you look for what's wrong and you miss out on financial opportunities. I think Instagram and TikTok makes this worse. They do. They do. Because seriously, you see what all the riches everybody else has, right? That I don't yeah. have. Yes. And it's all imaginary. So the other thing you need to know is it's all a lie. All sure. that TikTok stuff is, is false. But um, yeah, focusing on the lack block or focusing on lack will bring a block to, of abundance to you because you just you're, you're going to miss it every time. Yeah, my I actually have a family member who does that spends every time that I've that I talk to her, which frankly, I try not to do. Um, she she says, oh, I wish we had. Oh, I wish yes. we had. Oh, I wish we had. And I'm like, you could go get it. Yes. You could go. You could it. have it. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the spend block. This one's really fun. So this this one I see a lot of in my work with people who are in debt. And it's so closely related to another block called worthiness. But this one is really about feeling like, like you can't control your spending. So you'll either try and get control, which is what we see in people that have a lot of savings and a lot of debt, but they don't understand. You know, when you understand net worth, you'll be like, oh, I actually don't have this savings. The savings is imaginary because it's canceled out by the debt I have, right? But the, but the difference is you either hoard because you're trying to control or you feel a loss of control. But at the same time, interestingly, the loss of control is trying to get control. So the way you start to feel in control of your money is you'll spend. So sometimes, usually something's happened. Like as a kid, your parents said no to you a lot or you missed out on a lot of opportunities. So now that you're an adult and you have a credit card, you feel like you can't say no to yourself. That's one way it'll manifest. Like there's lots of different ways, but basically how it shows up is it prevents you from building wealth because you're spending on liabilities or consumer goods or other things and not spending on assets, which creates more abundance. So the block is that your spending is preventing you from building wealth. It's funny. There's a, there's a, a, a friend of mine. You'd love this woman, Buffy Purcell. She is a big, uh, I love her already by her name, Buffy. Purcell. Oh yeah, Buffy, Buffy's Buffy, amazing. I want to meet you. Oh, oh yeah. she, she, she's a Bravo star and, and just, she's got like half a million people follow her on TikTok, but she she she's got this great phrase here and that you'd love where she says uh, the three worst words a broke person can say is I deserve it mm -hmm. because I think it's this block. Right. It's this block, yeah. I just deserve I don't have the money, but I deserve it. And yeah. So, yeah. And then we and then we get into trouble. By the way, this, I think you point out, is kind of where the budget comes in. You said that this is because a budget will stop you from some of these dumb purchases. You talked yes. about during covid, you had to have. You had to have like a paint by numbers kit. I don't know what was wrong. I had a momentary lapse of idiosity. Like I do really well with managing my money. Like I am so good at it now. Right. Overall to the point where I don't even really think about it. It's just like, it's become part of my identity, right? Like I'm just, I know I trust myself. I'm good with money, whatever. And I, in COVID, I was in this fear, like I, I locked in my house and I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to pass the time? And I had that moment where I was like, oh, I, I need something. Like I just need something to entertain me. And I bought a paint by numbers kit. I think it was $50 and it arrived on my doorstep. And I was like, this is it. This is my new thing. I'm going to, I'm going to be a painter. I'm going to learn how to paint. And so I started making this gorilla painting and it's I heard still this only is how, I heard this is how Rembrandt started, by the way. Oh yeah. Just, just got a couple paint by numbers work. kits. Well, all I of a sudden was... doing these phenomenal things that are in the Louvre. <laughs> I was on my way. You know what I mean? I was like, I'm only about forty five more hours away from being in an art gallery. <laughs> so I bought this thing and then I had this moment where I was like, Aaron, this is an old behavior. This is not who you are now, right? I Halfway through the painting, I was like making a mess. The colors didn't work. It's nowhere. It's still not finished. If you want to buy it, I'll sell it to you for seventy dollars. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was this thing of like, oh, so you can catch yourself, right? When you ha once you know this about yourself, you know your money psychology. You can't unknow it. That's the beautiful part about it. So when you have the awareness, you can catch yourself and you can shift your decisions. This is, and, and by the way, you know, for people that love paint by numbers kit, your point isn't that paint by numbers kits are dumb. No. The, the, the point here for somebody for you, for me, for me, it was not. 
<laughs> the right choice. That's right. The uh, next block is the worthiness block. We, 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 we just talked about this a little bit. I don't, yeah. I don't deserve it. Yeah, it is. I don't deserve it. Worthiness is such a huge one. And what's interesting about the worthiness block is we all have it to some degree because the core human fear is that I won't be loved and I'm not enough. Like we all have that to some degree. It's just whether or not that's the driving force in your life. And if it's the driving force in your life, what ends up happening is anything good that comes to you, you believe is not meant for you. So you'll sabotage every time. So even things like I've seen people, women in relationships, like they meet a great guy and he's too good to be true. So they're like, no, I'm going to choose this guy over here who ghosts me every third date. And, you know, like, and so that, that worthiness block shows up in a way financially where we don't deserve wealth. Wealth is meant for them. It's meant for other, it's meant for someone else. And so we never fully embrace what we're capable of. This next block I saw, you know, different types of people will seek out financial advice, but the intelligence and skill block, I think it's kind of dangerous around a financial planner because especially an unscrupulous one, because these people think they're not intelligent or don't have the right skills. Yes. And the, this block blocks your flow of wealth because you always think somebody else should be giving you advice. Like you just don't trust yourself. You don't have enough self-trust built. And so we'll even see like in the personal development world, I see these personal development junkies where they take course right. after course after course, but they never implement anything or take action. So they're like just the people who just keep taking college courses. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. And so th- at some point you have to understand that your relationship to learning comes also from doing, not just from textbooks or classes or courses. And so that block prevents us because the thing that you have to take action on, it's not just knowing You know, the first time you go to buy an exchange traded fund, it's totally foreign. You're like, I don't know how to do this. What do I do? So a lot of people won't bother because they think I got to take a course on how to buy an exchange traded fund. So then they go spend money on the course. They would have been better off to lose 50 bucks in their first exchange traded fund to learn the things they need to learn. Right. And get going on the learning and and the wealth building versus like learning from someone else. So it's a huge one. And people who don't feel smart enough. The other thing that might happen is they might also avoid asking the right questions of their financial planner because they don't want to feel stupid. So then the financial planner who's good and kind doesn't have all the information they need to properly advise because you you have felt uncomfortable looking foolish. So that's a major block to wealth. Yeah, it is. It's a fine line in a lot of these because I felt like, you know, a lot of my clients were super smart people that could have yeah. easily done the stuff themselves, but smart people surround themselves with smart people. But, yeah. but it was funny. They would... The really smart people, I didn't feel this from. And don't get me wrong, people that have this block are also inte- more, much more intelligent than they think they are. They always are, yeah. So much more intelligent. But people that trusted themselves would just ask me all kind of probing questions to get even smarter. Like they yeah. were on this whole different different wavelength. You actually are really good at this because you will have people on your podcast who have different opinions than you have but you're always asking questions and staying in a posture of curiosity. And that is critical. A lot of people feel from a place of ego that I need to know the right answer. And so they won't even listen or have conversations with people who differ from them, which blocks them from learning, which potentially blocks them from opportunities for wealth building. See, that's not what's going on with me at all. No, (laughs) I'm open to being wrong. Yeah. I, I have on these people to prove to everybody. It's almost like the psychologist thing. I, I bring them on the show, prove they're an idiot, and I'm not. And that's, that's the, I feel like I'm getting, I'm apparently sure. getting nothing out of your work here. <laughs> oh my gosh, my cheeks. <laughs> it is so much easier to, add, I don't know, it is so much easier, though, to ask, how am I wrong? It and is. just continue to think, how am I wrong? All right, now, yes, next yes. up, uh, the hard work block. Man, I, I, th- 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 this is me. That's you, yeah long hours, just feel like you're never given enough. You just keep, you know, kind of grinding it out. Yeah. If I just work harder, if I I just just work work harder. harder. Yeah. And for a lot of people overcoming this block really does involve investing so that you can really understand compounding money because you're running out of time, right? When you put in 50 hours a day, you don't have that much time. There's just an impossibility, right? And so a lot of people are trying to squeeze so much in and working harder and they're missing out on the juice of life. And so I know that you, I know you call yourself, you know, you've got this block, but it's minor in you compared to most people because you also understand how wealth works. So you're doing a lot of the things that are compounding on the side, but a lot of people aren't. And so they get trapped right in this. Totally do. Yeah. It's really, really tough. Makes so me so understanding frustrated. Time leverage and financial leverage change that, changes that block completely. 
It's like we, we're going to talk to uh, a gentleman about this on Wednesday, about mm. how money's not the only currency. So I think yes. you and Chad together is just a great yes. week for us. Yeah. Drop this line to Chad. Say, privacy is one of the most important currencies and see what he has to say. Oh. Yeah. I, th- I think he'd like that. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, the stress block. This one, I tell you, lots of people think finances are stressful. This is a block that's learned also. And one of the most interesting things about the stress block is you really believe that the stress is outside yourself. So money is the cause of your stress. But what we know to be true, and this is really ugly, so brace yourself because nobody likes hearing this, is that money isn't stressful. You are stressed. All of the emotions we have already live inside us. So happiness is inside you. Joy is inside you. Frustrations inside you. Anger is inside you. They all live inside you all the time. And when something happens, you almost unconsciously choose what to call forth. And we know this is true because if external circumstances were entirely responsible for how we feel, no kids would ever cry at Disneyland, right? <laughs> right? You're in the happiest place on earth. I'm sorry you're not allowed to cry here, right? That's So we know that it's not about anything external. There's something going on inside. And so when we blame money and we decide that money is stressful, it blocks the flow of wealth to our lives because what we're doing is we're trying to avoid that stress. So we avoid money, which means we're avoiding wealth. It's a very dangerous cycle to be in. So we have to to heal that block. We have to obviously shift how we're handling money and how we view money because it's just as easy to think money is stressful as it is to think money is fun and money is a game and money can be enjoyable. The uh, procrastination block, I'm going to I'm going to move over because I think <laughs> by the name, we kind of get where that one's going. But the money guilt block, I want to focus on as the last one here, because yeah. so many of us, you know, we talked about judging each other. We have so much yeah. guilt around money and like yes. past things, past places we messed up yeah. like that, you, you know, like buying your paint by numbers kit. You could keep that guilt forever. Yes. And the interesting thing about guilt is guilt is such a selfish emotion which again is something nobody likes to hear, but guilt makes somebody else's problem about me. So even if I come at everything from the posture of, I don't want to have money because I feel like it's unfair because there's so many people hurting in the world. I'm taking their pain and I'm making it about me. And instead, if I'm truly wanting to help them, I have to be in a place of abundance so that I can provide meaningful help for people and not just make it about me not you know, reaching my full potential because somebody else can't reach theirs. Like put on your own mask first. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The, uh, I have to ask you the big question now. I usually yeah. say the big question for the end. Yes. What is a twat waffle? <laughs> Listen, I am amazed that the publisher <laughs> let me get twat waffle past the three editors. <laughs> I do have that word in there. <laughs> It's just a name we gave somebody who was really difficult at one point in time. It's a story in the book. Um, and so we've just forever referred to her as the twat waffle and she's quite legendary. And you know, if you re- she's even in the get the hell out of debt book. So she, she lives on forever, but we all have a twat waffle in our lives and we can't let the twat waffles among us uh, impede our ability to get where we want to go financially. Just a fabulous name for somebody. Isn't it great? I yeah. am stealing that from you, Aaron. I'm so <laughs> stealing that because I know a few twat waffles. But, but but I do like this idea about the, the 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 ability to change the energy is inside you. I mean, and you point this out at the beginning of this of this project that yeah. you know you're not a, a licensed therapist, and some people have some really bad issues where they need a therapist. Yeah. But for the rest of us, you can change your state. You can change Absolutely. your your energy. Yeah, and I think we often think that we're uh, we don't realize we're thermostats. So one of your great gifts is when you walk in a room, you bring just so much vivaciousness and fun and humor and brilliance. And it, this sounds like I'm constantly giving you compliments and I, I don't know, want people like, to think I, I like you. That's we weird. Just BFFs yeah. here. Yeah. Now. <laughs> but it's I like, feel like I owe you 20 bucks, you, <laughs> but it's, it's true. Like Carrie and I, Carrie's Carrie and I work together. And whenever Carrie has to deal with Joe, she's like, you were going to have Joe on our podcast or you're going to go on Joe's podcast that everybody's happy because we know that you are a predictably positive person who has their poop in a group, even though you are hard on yourself and you have high expectations of yourself, you are just, it, that's just who you are. That's the energy. You're like, that's the thermostat setting that you live life at. And you don't take anything too seriously, which is a really beautiful posture to live in. And you stay curious and you love your partner and you do the best you can every day and all of that. There are other people who suck the energy out of the room every time you're around them. And that's the thermostat setting they live their life at. 
And oftentimes people are unconscious. I think you are very conscious about how you show up because you notice you're very good at being aware of other humans. So you notice in other people when their energy is off. You're very good at reading people emotionally. Some people aren't. And they'll walk around almost like an energy vampire. They suck the life out of the room or they, they're just like a black hole. They maybe complain or maybe they're just that type of person who just being around them, you just don't feel good. And that's a thermostat setting that they have that they forget that they've got control over. And so when we condition ourselves and we live away a certain way for long enough, it does become part of our identity. It becomes part of who we are. So now when people talk about Joe, they're like, I love this guy. You have raving fans because of who you are. There's other people who are raving twat waffles because <laughs> of how they show up. And all twat waffle needs to do is really take a personal inventory of the results in her life and the people she's surrounded with to kind of go, oh, I don't think this is working. But it's not everybody else's fault. It's twat waffles fault. My, my, my coach calls them clusters of misery. Oh, I it, like that. And she said, beware these clusters of misery. Like you can feel like misery all together, like they're. There, and we had, when I was a financial planner, we had this group of people that would go, they were all smokers and they would all go on smoke break together. But there were two of them that were total twat waffles that were the leaders. And I told my, I, I had an employee who smoked and I said, you just want to avoid that cluster of misery. If you go down and you smoke with them, you're yeah. going to come back here just so bitter, just yeah. so, cause it's impossible not to be like, it's yeah. so, so bad. But I love what your friend said about this twat waffle. Like, what, what, what do you learn from this? Like, just yeah. thinking, what do I learn from this person? So this happened. We were backstage in an event um, with a major number one success strategist in the world. And we're trying to, like, get this event together. And she was walking around backstage. It was really weird. I, what I know of her to be true is that she just had a very wounded ego. Like, she'd been hurt before, obviously. And she had a really high need for significance, which means... She was operating from a place of needing to feel important or needing to feel whatever, but she wasn't, she didn't actually feel that way. She was sort of trying to demand it from other people. This was a generational thing, but years ago I would hear people say like, oh, you, you know, to their children, you have to respect me. I'm your father. Well, you can't demand respect from somebody. You can't like force them to respect you. But that was kind of the attitude she walked around with. And she would light these little fires everywhere she went and we'd all have to put them out. She would create so much drama. Like the police would get called. Like it was just... Everywhere she went, there was like this constant chaos in her life. And she kept saying, I don't know why everything's so dramatic. And we were all like, we know why this is so dramatic. Right? Like, we all know why. If you think things in your life are dramatic, it's because you're causing it. But anyway. And so my friend Jenny just turned to me and she was like, uh, hey, because she could see I was just like I was welling up. I was like, these volunteers were leaving. Like the whole day was kind of falling apart. And I was just a volunteer, too. But it was like just everything was just chaos. And she just said, Aaron, what is the lesson here? And I was like, you asshole. I don't want to think of, you know what I mean? I don't want this to be a lesson right now. I want her to fix her ways. Right. She's got to, she's got to stop twat waffling around. But what it did for me is it first made me think, okay, I never want to be like this. So how do I show up? Like, I can't let her affect me. And then also like the other pieces were later on, how can I use this for my own growth? And it was just such a powerful transformation that I had to go through, which ended up being one twat waffle was one of the greatest gifts of my life, but only because I was able to see her as a mirror for what was going on for me. We should just call this episode twat waffle. I don't, <laughs> you know, and it's funny because people are like, I thought this was going to be about budgets and I thought this was going to be about meetings. And it totally is all of this all, without going through these blocks and, and understanding yourself, you can't understand the people around you and you can't help each other. It just, yeah. it's, so, it, it's, it was such a, a I thought it was going to be a powerful idea because I know you, but, but when I read it and then I realized that it was all about me on the inside, 90% mm -hmm. of this is about yeah. me on the inside to show up at that naked meeting, to be able to be naked, you know, yeah. to, to be able yeah. to get there. Um, I, I want to talk about one more thing because for some people, this is kind of woo woo stuff, right? Yeah. It's kind of I'm like, woo -woo. Woo -woo. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's not, to, okay. You know, like when people come to my office when I was a planner and I'd say, Hey, tell me your goals. I'm like, I don't care about that. Let's not do the whole goal setting thing. Why don't we just invest the money and do tax strategies? Cause that's, you know, that's, that's yeah. where the bread's buttered. But, but, but for you, you, t you talk about having somebody that you worked with that did this 
tapping thing mm-hmm. with, 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 to talk about woo woo. My coach has been talking to me about tapping forever. And I'm like, yeah, no, thanks. Like, you Jenny know, McKinney. Yeah. So this was the girl who was with me backstage when this twat waffle incident happened. And what was Jenny is very, she's my friend. That's like a, a little wild, you know what I mean? She's like the, she's like the fun one. She's like the one who like, I think she can hear the wind. Like she's just one of those people who she's, she's not a, into like astrology or anything like that, but she's oh, just, yeah. I was going to say she's at home recharging her crystals as we're no, recording not this. Quite like that, but, but she, Oh, I don't think I have any of those friends. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I'm not knocking anybody who has crystals. No. I think they're really beautiful, but I try and really live my life by what I'm in control of. I don't make the crystals in charge of my finances. So I, it, it's a little bit far for me, but even with Jenny, like she, she had done, she had herself gone through something really traumatic and her therapist said to her, you need to try tapping. The level of trauma you've been through is insane. And I would like you to try this technique. And so she looked into it and it turns out that this technique is what they use to help soldiers or people who've been over to war and it has cured PTSD in a lot of them. Like it's such a great technique for, and I was like, come on, cured PTSD. Like we need drugs for that. Right. Like there's, I was like, I don't believe it. And so she, she tried it and she said that this childhood trauma that she'd been through, which was horrific has, it's been for the most part healed. So she became a certified EFT practitioner. And then she comes to me and says, you know what we should do? We should do a session with people in the Get the Hell Out of Debt program where we tap on these money blocks, these eight money blocks, and we see what the results are, see if it increases their, you know, net worth. And I was like, I'm not doing that. Like, like, That's totally me. That's yeah, to, like, I'm like, and cut. I'm not doing that. Yeah. I'm like, they need to take their budget and it needs to increase their net worth. And that's how we do it. We're going to do it with math. And she was like, I really think this would help them. But I had just started all this work on um, these money blocks and was really seeing huge progress in a lot of my own clients. And I was like, well, it can't hurt, right? What's basically you like tap on your head and you tap above your eyebrows and you tap yeah. under your nose and you tap, right? What well, is it going to hurt? Just people tapping themselves. We'll see what happens. So we did. We tried an eight week process and, and I mostly did it just because I love Jenny so much, right? It was like, I'll help you in your little career, whatever, right? It's like a be so cute. Yeah. I was the tra- twat waffle in this situation. So I was like, sure, I'll help you. So we do it. And in the meantime, we did a control group. So we just, the people who were in the Get the Hell Out of Debt program, we divided them in half and we said, you are the control group. You're just going to keep doing everything Erin teaches in the Get the Hell Out of Debt program. You're going to pay down your debt. You're going to increase your net worth. You're going to do all the things she teaches. Then the other half were like, you're also going to tap once a week with Jenny for eight weeks. We're going to see what happens. So the people in the control group in the Get the Hell Out of Debt program. Did great. Their net worth grew by $4,753.71 on average. Over eight weeks, right? That's huge. Yeah. Huge. The control group, however, or not the control group. The tapping group. The tapping group, however, blew my mind. 32,202. That's how much their net worth grew in eight weeks. That's incredible. I, when we were done... So neither Jenny nor I did the numbers. We had another independent party do all the numbers and stuff for us. Cause I, part of me was like this way, I'll be able to prove to Jenny that it doesn't really work. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when we got the numbers, I was like, I don't believe you. Like, let's see them. Like, what numbers did you use? And they were like, no, I use the, and I was like, okay, take off the highest person and the lowest person. And then like, let's see the numbers. Let's take off the person like and and the, the rule was they had to show up for all 8 weeks. So if they didn't show up for 8 weeks, they were removed from the numbers and they were removed from the program essentially just so we could have active sure. numbers. And when on average they paid off or sorry, not paid off, they increased their net worth by $32,000. I was like, okay, there is something to this. These money blocks really do impede our ability to build wealth if we're not paying attention. I was like that a ton before I did hypnosis. I was the same way about, and I had a client who did hypnosis and I was the same, Aaron. I was like, oh, let me, let let me go help you with your little career and I will do this. So, so, you know, I'm always worried about my weight. So I, so I went in for weight loss and we did three sessions and the first session was nice and thoughtful and I kind of got it that hypnosis wasn't walking around like a chicken. It was, you know, this whole different thing. And the second time I really felt like I was finally relaxed enough and into it enough that there was some real hypnosis going on. But the third time, holy crap, 
Like I realized I all of a sudden had this vision of my family as, as we were growing up, my mom would put my brother and I in the back of the station wagon. My sister wasn't born yet. And we would go pick up my dad on the lunch break, on his lunch break at General Motors. And we would drive to this little fast food place called Dog and Suds, like a Sonic, pretty much, you know, you pull up yeah. and we have the, so, and I remember just how fun that was going with my dad. And still today, I'm 55 years old. I equate fast food with family, love, and good times. Yes. I still do. I see the golden arches. I'm like, oh, this will be so fun. And then afterwards, I'm like, I regret that so much. And it was, and it, but, but it's funny because I could finally put together these two things that seem to have nothing to do with each other. And yet for me, it's, you know, when I get in trouble, it's because I, I, I'm not thinking. So I go hit up a Taco Bell. Yeah. That's powerful. That's so powerful. That's exactly the work, right? It's like we forget as fully functioning adults how much of our lives are driven by things that happened to us in our childhood. We'd like to think we grew up and we learned to adult, but we're really just deep down a bunch of wounded kids walking around. Yeah, we totally are. These uh, th these money blocks are so important to figure out. The book is called Naked Money Meetings, Ending Money Fights with Your Partner Forever. I think it would even be called Ending Money Fights with Yourself Forever <laughs> as well. And it's available tomorrow. Yes, I'm so excited. You are excited. You said if, if people go to the website, though, that you all, you have the quiz right there. People want to take that at a time. Yeah. If you want to know right now, like if you're like, wow, I think I actually have one of these blocks and I need to know what to do. You just go to nakedmoneymeetings.com and you can just click and fall and it'll spit out for you and it'll tell you. And then if you send the quiz to your partner, it'll tell you what's going on in your relationship, too. So it's a really handy tool if you're ever feeling like, gosh, I just feel stuck in this one area. What's going on? you can identify the block that's running your life right now. Do you want to just come be on every show? Could you just be on every show of ours? <laughs> I mean, that's just the Joe and Aaron show. Can you Let's imagine we have three listeners? It'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> All five of us would get along so well. Aaron, thanks for hanging out with us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Big thanks to Aaron for joining us. Oh, gee, I love it every time she's on and she makes a great point. We have to. We have to have these difficult conversations uh, with our partner and um, and, you know, sometimes we're going to disagree and that's OK. I think I think as, if we started from the perspective of it's not a difficult conversation, it's just a conversation. It becomes a lot easier. I mean, having a having a discussion about money, having a discussion about the things that are important to you, the goals that you want to achieve, the thing that the areas that you've screwed up, the thing that you just did yesterday that screwed up, you know, I mean, being open and honest is quite often the easiest way to just just kind of me meander through life. And uh, and it's true with money, too. And expect that you probably will have a difference of opinion. I like that as well. 100 percent. Absolutely. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. Landscaping companies. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find one. You're you're well, wait a minute. You are the landscaping company. I know it. That's, I know I it. that's the bigger point there. But I'm trying to find one that I can afford even on my salary. Um, they're not out there. Huge, huge salary. Uh, you get paid. Do we, do we pay him for this? OG. Uh, when I get around to it. <laughs> Sounds about right. It's, it's actually loved ones in your time. Your loved ones in your time with a little jingle in your pocket. That's even better. It's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackedbenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote at Haven Life. They are committed to offering a modern way to buy life insurance. It's a simple application. It's all online. You'll get an instant coverage decision. No waiting weeks or months to decide if you qualify. And they're a company that uh, is backed by the power of Mass Mutual, more than 160 year old insurer. Today, we are going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to Stacker Zachary. Hey, Zachary. Hi, Joe. Hi, OG. Hi, not my mom's neighbor, Doug. What the hell? Uh, so, advertisements, huh? They're one of the easiest ways for corporations to get your hard-earned money. But, you know, some advertisements just suck. So, my question is, what are some of the worst advertisements you have ever seen? Uh, thanks for taking my call. See you later. Bye. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Stackery well, Zachary. This definitely requires OG's expertise. Yes. 
Uh, I think it does. OG watches a lot of watches a lot of television, especially in the fall. Can you think of any commercials that really suck? Hmm. Why don't you guys go first on this one? I've got a. I tend to fast forward all the commercials. You know the one. The one I <laughs> hate is everybody knows that sig- that sound. Oh, that's TiVo. <laughs> yes. It's amazing how everybody knows that sound, but TiVo hasn't really been around as a presence in like 10 years, but everybody knows we still do it in my house. When it's, when you hit a commercial, we just say those noises. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Yep. Come on, man. You're driving fast forward. Uh, <laughs> apparently TiVo's this is we're so far off, but uh, TiVo was one of the first devices that let you easily fast forward through commercials. So as long as we're talking about dumb commercials, I suppose it's relevant. They apparently have some licensing with some of the larger set top box makers. Like there are people, my brother, in uh, the Boston area, his Xfinity box actually is a TiVo operating system. Uses TiVo tech? Yeah. And there are some around. I don't know why it's regional like that, but there are some around. But anyway, the one that I that still annoys me, or that I think it's Capital One, the guy that, that wears a suit that's way too small, and he's like the easiest decision in the history of decision or in the history of easy. And I am not going to a bank to have a cup of coffee. Why they're making these... Why they're making these lounges in banks is just the stupidest idea to me. I don't know who inside the corporate headquarters got that approved, but that's not anything that's going to attract my financial decision making. I think that um, so many people are intimidated by the inside of a bank and by making it less intimidating. I think it's actually a good thing. I think that's a I think it's a, a cool innovation. I mean, don't get me wrong. It shouldn't go. Oh, they serve donuts. I need to put my money there. Like that's not a great decision, but making it more inviting, I think, is is. Uh, is I think you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, I think OG. Uh, Nobody wants you know, to go only, to an inside of a bank, Joe. Nobody <laughs> wants to go there. Period. Inviting well, or otherwise, people just want to stay home. But why are they advertising? Why. We have this nice lobby. Nobody wants to even why. go to the lobby. The reason why is because we've chased people out of the lobby. Like we're like I don't want to go I don't want to go near no, that that, no wanna, that is not why it's just dumb, inconvenient dumb to have bank, to go so. to a different place when I can do it all online. You don't get free suckers because we've turned it into a commodity. There's a type of ad that I don't like, but I'm not alone. I, you guys both remember SNL has even made fun of this type of commercial with uh, well let's listen into one. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Hey, Matt, I think there might be one more gift for your mom right there. It hasn't been a normal year, so this Christmas, get her something extraordinary during the Lexus December to Remember sales event. Nathan, you didn't. With flexible financing and 0% APR, there's never been a better time to buy or lease a new Lexus. Merry Christmas, baby. Are you kidding me, Nathan? (laughs) Did you seriously buy a car without asking me? Well... Because for Christmas... This is a major purchase! Right? But it it was a December to remember. It's a Lexus! We don't have the money for this, Nathan! We don't? No, we don't! Your father doesn't... Your father hasn't worked since last March. What? Yeah, COVID has hit a lot of people hard, and I'm no exception. Nathan, you got fired in March 2019. COVID had nothing to do with it. (laughs) Hey, pal, I guess your old man's busted. Mm. It's beginning to look a lot like savings. So get to your local Lexus dealer today. How much did you spend on this ridiculous car, Nathan? It was only $39.99 to its signing. Four grand. It's not that much, babe. And how much is the monthly payment? The what? Did you think this entire car cost $4,000? Uh-huh. There's a monthly payment. Yeah, but with the 0% APR, I think it's all good. APR? APR? Do you mean APR? I'm pretty sure it's APR. What? I'm pretty sure it's APR. And then if you remember, then the then the neighbor comes over because he just borrowed money from the neighbor. He said to borrow yeah. the 4000 bucks from his neighbor. <laughs> I, when, when he said, but it's Christmas, I could all I could hear was OG. It just sound, it sounded like his voice. <laughs> but it's the Christmas thing and the stuff. OG hasn't been a, OG hasn't been a financial planner in years. <laughs> COVID took a lot of people out. <laughs> Yeah, those those are annoying. I'm like, are you kidding me? You bought a Lexus, right? And you didn't ask me. That's or, or there's even the GMC did a his and her truck commercial. I think oh, last holiday. So yeah, let's just horrible. get two. Yeah, as well. She got a puppy. He got a truck. 
There's that one. <laughs> There's that one too. I got yeah. you something. Here's a little puppy. I got you something. Here's a big pickup truck. Well, let's talk about some of the deceptive things that um, that that companies use in advertising. I went and looked up some of these because I think just as a consumer, you got to be able to look through the commercial and go, okay, how are they selling me on this thing? And the first one they use, they talk about here is uh, priming. Uh, this piece says this technique involves exposing consumers to a stimulus that influences their response to a subsequent stimulus. For example, shows a happy family enjoying a product, which can prime viewers to associate the product with positive emotions. This will be like, yep. you know, the Disney commercials or the, you know, we're all just a family. And that's why we spend 16 bags of money visiting the mouse or the cruise ships, right? The cruise ships do that one. Another, another really common one. I'm sure everybody, I'm not, uh, telling anything you don't know, but the reason they show uh, fast food ads late at night is not because they think you're going to go out of the house and go get the fast food right then, but they know you're hungry. Then if it's 10, 11 o'clock, they know your stomach's starting to talk to you. So you're going to start to associate that image with the feeling of hunger. So that when you get hunger again, it just, that image just shows up in your head the next day when it's time for lunch or whatever. They know you're not leaving your house at 1130 to go to McDonald's, you, yeah. but is that why <laughs> it's all closed. Show, is that why all they show is Taco Bell and Dorito ads yeah. on Chive TV? Right. Because, you know, you got to be high to be watching that stuff. Uh, the decoy effect. This technique involves presenting consumers with three options, one which is clearly inferior to the other two. The inferior option is included to make the other ones just seem more uh, attractive. That's the, uh, that's like the... Um, the sticky tape, what's that called? Flex seal. It's like, oh yeah. You use regular duct tape, and it's like a piece of scotch tape or something like that. They're like, your boat won't be able to, you know, you're you're screwed. You're gonna sink in the ocean. You ever try to scotch tape your boat? But use flex seal, and you can go fishing today. <laughs> The illusion of, of scarcity, of course, uh, create a sense of urgency. I saw one of these just literally yeah, yesterday yeah. In, in one of my online feeds going, the next nine people. And then you think about that for just a second. You're like, okay, this this ad they must have bought for like a week. And it mm-hmm. says the next nine people get this. Right. Loss aversion. This is uh, insurance to think about all state involves emphasizing what consumers stand to lose. Mayhem, you know. Oh, I thought you, you said know. loss of virgin. No, it's a whole, whole different thing for you. It's just where Doug's crying in the corner later. Uh, Bandwagon effect. Think about those Dr. Pepper commercials where the whole town is Dr. Pepper involves suggesting everybody else is, is, is using it. Uh, That's a good one. And then another one here, emotional appeal, Uh, jewelry commercials. Think about these involves appealing to their emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, and then celebrity endorsements. Uh, those are just a few of the techniques. Of course, you guys, if, if some if people are new stackers, if you're new to the show, you don't know that there's one type of commercial we think is the best commercial of all time. And of course, it's a, uh, well, it's, it's, it's this defunct campaign. Bud Light presents Real Men of Genius. Real Men of Genius. Today, we salute you, Mr. Silent Killer Gas Passer. Mr. Silent Killer Gas Passer. Last night, you had the enchilada combo platter. This morning, the three cheese omelet with broccoli. This afternoon, you're a ticking time bomb. Because of you, a simple elevator ride is suddenly a 42-floor plummet into the very bowels of hell. Sweet mercy, please just someone light a match. <laughs> so crack open an ice cold Bud Light, oh ninja of the nasty. And while you're at it, crack open a window. Mr. Silent Killer Gas Passer. Those couldn't be better. Could not be better. I agree. Thanks, Zachary, for the question. If you've got a question, uh, maybe about your money. <laughs> And not just about commercials. Uh, send those uh, to us at stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. And if you're brave enough, like Zachary was, to call in with a question, well, then you know what? We send you a Haven Lifeline Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt as a thank you uh, for stepping up to the plate and helping the show. 
Well, before we say goodbye for this episode, uh, just our community calendar this week, if you want to find us on all the different channels, on uh, you may be watching us on YouTube today. If not, subscribe to the our YouTube channel. If you want to hang out with us uh, generally, and I will be there this week on Thursday, uh, we do an Instagram Live every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern, as long as I am in town. Uh, this Thursday, we have Lisa Fisher, who's the chief lending officer at a new at a new fintech company called Mission Lane. We used to do a uh, Friday fintech segment, um, but we've moved those to our Instagram channel where we learn about some of the cool new innovations that uh, hit your phone and your wallet. Mission Lane is a pretty interesting company. Lisa was somebody she's going to tell the story on Thursday, OG. But uh, she found out that her husband uh, at the time was a huge gambler and had uh, basically wrecked the family's credit completely. And so Mission Lane helps people out with uh, credit issues that might have as much to do with the people around them as it has to do with them. We're going to talk to Lisa on Thursday on Instagram. What I love about our Instagram lives is you get to ask questions as well. So join us Thursday on the uh, Stacky Benjamin's Instagram channel. If you want to find out all the places where you can hang out with us, it's stackybenjamins.com slash welcome is our welcome guide. And that's what's going on this week. Uh, but if you're not here to hang out with us on Instagram, you're not here for the fa- the fantastic Bud Light commercials. You're here because you need to make better decisions with your money as we roll into fall. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash OG because that's linked to OG's calendar. He and his team are taking clients still for a little bit longer this uh, this fall. I I should use some of that commercial manipulation there, OG, and just go the next nine people. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Prices increase at midnight. <laughs> I should do, do free some shipping. Of that. <laughs> Wait, what? Stackybenjamins.com. Well, right, there's more. <laughs> Are you, you sitting today. down? <laughs> stackybenjamins.com slash OG. (laughs) All right. uh, Coming up on Wednesday, Chad Carson, Coach Carson, has a very philosophical way at looking at building your real estate empire. And he says that a lot of people create a full-time job out of uh, managing real estate. And if you want somebody who's buying some of the other currencies, we're going to talk about other currencies like time on Wednesday show with Coach Carson. So join us uh, then. But for now, this is where we wrap up the show. Doug, what are our top three takeaways, man? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Aaron Sky Kelly and address financial matters with your partner head on. Second, wear what makes you feel good rather than wasting your hard-earned cash trying to look supreme with pricey designer clothing. See what I did there? But the big lesson? Squirrels cannot be trained, no matter what that busker on the Vegas Strip told you. Thanks to Erin Sky Kelly for joining us today. You'll find her new book wherever books are sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Wonder how beautiful we all are? Of course, you'll never know if you don't check out our YouTube version of this show, engineered by Tina Eichenberg. Then you'll see once and for all that I'm the best thing that ever happened to this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Of course you do. Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Youngkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. 
This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. I, quite a wild thing happened yesterday on the way home. Turns out. So, funny story. Speaking, of, speaking, speaking of that. Airlines and lavatories. And uh, I, so I, uh, you know, from time to time, you may have to use the restroom. The facility. So, yes. I, so I go into the facility and I sit down and I look, I look up at the door and it says, make sure you lock the door. I'm like, oh, that would be embarrassing. And it shows a person and then it shows a an arrow and a lock at the end of the arrow where the, 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 the arrow is pointed toward the lock. So I take the thing and I move it toward the lock. And then about 30 seconds later, the door opens because I had already locked the door and I unlocked it. And here I am. In my. Hello, best. And some lovely lady got the surprise of a lifetime. There's Was so the many, little picture so of the lock at the end of the arrow, did it have that funny shaped hook at the top of it with a little gap Swear underneath it? it? I don't know. I was so damn tired. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been on lock. Pro tip, like, that means it's unlocked, Joe, when you got the I, little funny. I don't know what the hook is at the top of that little block at the bottom. I've never known. But over time, I've just learned, oh, that means the door will open. Isn't that a master lock at the bottom of the little thing? And then the hook at the top. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I was sure I was locking the door, though. And that wasn't it. But, you know, we got much more important stuff to talk about because while I was gallivanting out west, man, we had lots of big stuff happen. The 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 Wagner guy getting shot down. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. That's speculation. So, yeah, yeah, that would have <laughs> never happened. The Russians would have taken that guy down. <laughs> We had a, we had a political a debate, w, by the way. What, Wagner, Wagner? Yes. Yes. And the Wall Street Journal had a nice article on this. They, they, they reviewed a whole bunch of, of the video footage, which I always find interesting. You know, when there's some sort of, you know, calamity like that, right? Not, not, I'm not just talking about this, but um, there, was a, there was a helicopter that, that crashed in Miami a couple of days ago, sadly. I saw that you one. Know, injuring a number of people, and I think killing one person but um th just the, the how does somebody have a video of that right you know what i mean like mm. it is it, it it's very odd you know and 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 we should bring paula into this because yes, she, she, had the, she had the she had the crane yeah. video and it's like i i don't necessarily think the first thing that i think of is i should i should record this you know that looks <laughs> that looks funny i'm gonna record this but there's oh my god i'm going viral and that dude's dying <laughs> Well, it's not even it's not even that. It's just more like the timing is very suspicious. Like, how do they have footage of that uh, plane exploding? Yeah, that is weird because nobody, you know, well, I, I mean, yeah. I planes fly over my house all the time. I don't think, well, I right. probably should video this one just in case something bad happens. Right. I've been doing this for 12 and a half years and finally, finally <laughs> got one. Yeah. No, that the no, plane, bad. the plane thing is highly suspicious. I don't We'll have to talk to Paula about what. What precipitated her picking up her phone? Was the crane like starting to teeter or there big noises happening that, you know, she's not sure that caused her. Yeah. But, yeah. She, you might not have been there for that session, but she, uh, she said that she saw the smoke and was just going to video a little bit and put it on her Instagram. So she saw the smoke. I actually was yeah. there for that. Thanks for yeah. not remembering that and my it, presence was significant. Well, all this that. big stuff going on in the world. I got something much bigger that I noticed while I was Hurricanes on vacation. Today. That annoys everybody the hell out of me. Getting... This is this is horrible, OG. Have you noticed that that retail people now, when you walk into a store, say welcome in, they don't say welcome anymore. They say welcome in. Welcome yeah. in. What? No, a, that I doesn't happen. Stores and B, I have never heard that in my life. It is the weirdest crap. Once you hear it, by the way, you won't unhear it. Kinda sorta. Are 
I had to go shopping with Cheryl in Dallas before. <laughs> right, exactly. Was it a resale <laughs> shop? It was. It was. No, <laughs> that's what I thought. Right. Where the hell are we? No, I, I walked into Banana Republic and they go, welcome in. And then we go to OG. What's that store that Mrs. OG likes with the uh, shorts and the Victoria's Secret? Oh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the one you like. That's the story. That's your favorite store. That's what's the funniest the, thing he said in years. What's the store? Valori? Val- 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 Viore. 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 Yeah. We walked into Viore. Leisure. Woman looks at me right after I just went to to uh, Banana Republic, and the woman says it. Woman looks at me and goes, "Welcome in." I'm like what the hell? Then we go down to another store. You know, I guess uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Welcome in. We don't need the word in. Like, why do we have the word in? What did you say? Welcome like, out on your way out. No. Or huh. goodbye out. I don't, yeah. I don't, see you out. See yourself as out. As it offends you, apparently. Oh, it was, this is big stuff. I mean, I know there's other things going on, but I'd never heard that before. Speaking and then of big stuff. When did we're you, in. Um, did you leave? Uh, do you have an Amazon fire stick that you left at my house? <laughs> well, thank you. No, <laughs> I did. It sounds painful leaving that here at his house. Oh, well, you left I headphones. Did. That I saw. I did leave headphones. Oh, yeah. I just figured that was yours too. But no, I'll spend the other guy that was standing. I was going to say who. <laughs> I'm spreading. I'm like the Johnny Appleseed of Amazon Fire Sticks. They're easy to no. forget. Welcome in. Welcome in. You're going to hear it all the time now, and you're going to go. Right. Where, when so did this say. start? I don't really talk to people generally, so I doubt that I would hear it. Nor do I go places. He's there. Oh, gee. Oh, gee. Doug, 10 years from now, oh, gee's going to be on the show going, I I didn't hear crap. It, <laughs> it was nothing. Amazon delivery guy. I saw a funny, I saw a funny uh, thing on Reddit the other day. <clears throat> somebody had to, uh, somebody had to uh, uh, order a new set of AirPods. And you know how when you, uh, some, some things that you order, they ask for delivery instructions when you, you know, when you have the order, you know, whatever, here's the gate code, whatever it is. <clears throat> and uh, he thought that he put the delivery instructions, but instead it was the engraving. Nice flex. <laughs> I don't know. Butler's name. <laughs> <laughs> Not that at all. Gate That's what it says. It'll Jesus. say gate code on there. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, if you're somebody who's delivered to your house, you got to say like, "Just trust me, you're still on the right path for a mile." You know, you'll pull into logging the driveway. road number for me. If you won't know where you comes. are. But just trust me, keep driving for a mile, and then you'll get to the house. Anyways, it said uh, the the engraving said uh, back door, please. Oh no! Or, no it said back door if possible. And that's what he put on the engraving instead of the. Uh, he, thought it was he put that instruction on the iPods instead of he thought it was a the delivery, delivery instructions. instructions. Nice. That, that might not go the way he hoped it would have. 